Hi, I'm James from Chaosium. I sat down with Mike Mason, who is the creative director of Call of Cthulhu, and we talked about unkillable enemies. It's pretty common to come across some kind of cosmic horror that you can't beat in a fair fight when you're playing Call of Cthulhu. It creates an interesting dynamic for games, so I asked Mike to talk a little bit about it. I started off the interview by asking him to define exactly what an unkillable enemy is. I'll jump across the interview in just a moment, but first, please remember to subscribe, and thanks for watching. An unkillable monster means a monster that is <laughs> unkillable in terms of combat tends to be, you know, how in 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 many role playing games and certainly in traditional role playing games, uh, monsters are something that ninety percent of the time are, are are meant to be kind of obstacles that the characters overcome normally by you know, getting into a fight with them and killing them or disabling them in some way um maybe evading them potentially but but you know ultimately that's what i mean so when you've been an unkillable monster you can't rush at it with your sword shotgun you know mallet or whatever it is you've got in your hand because it's not going to really do anything it, you know maybe they're maybe they're so tough it doesn't even go through their armor or because with you know monsters from the cthulhu mythos Maybe they are built differently and they just, you know, bullets pass right through them and, you know, they're immaterial in some way. Uh, or they work with, you know, a different vibration, cosmic vibration. Um, so physical things don't really affect them. So that's a kind of an unkillable monster. I've played a lot of games where you come across something like this. And it can feel a little bit like a, a blocker or a plot device that the GM is throwing in because they don't want you to be able to engage with some aspect. They, they need an NPC to deliver a quest or something like that. It, that's not really the same in Call of Cthulhu because these unkillable monsters, your goal can sort of still be to kill them, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's just changing the words. It's, it's not you're not about killing the monster now you're dealing with the monster how do you deal with the monster and that may not be killing them you know it often isn't the case with particularly with these types of uh, entities um the other factor to think about is why is the monster there i mean we've talked about that particular concept in a in an earlier video so you know check that out but but you know why is the monster there? Monsters should never just be there as something to kill. You know, it, it's more important than that. It, it, it should play a, a stronger role in in the plot, effectively. And um, so, you know, bear that in mind. Don't don't just throw monsters in, into a game for no with no thought. So, can you give us an example from the Call of Cthulhu scenario or campaign catalog, uh, where you have an unkillable monster that the players still have to deal with in a pretty major way as a core part of the scenario? An unkillable monster. Let me talk about the first time I, as a as a kind of a player and a keeper, kind of really experienced one in game, and and that was in a really old scenario that actually has never been professionally published. It was actually in um, a fanzine, and I believe it was in uh, the Dagon fanzine, the old uh, British Call of Cthulhu fanzine back in the day, published by Carl T. Ford, who uh, unfortunately has now passed. Um, I mean, I, I'm going to have to spoil the plot somewhat to kind of tell you about it, so please bear with me. But it, it's all about a hound of tinder loss. And so um, it's maybe, you know, back in the day, one of the first times we encountered a Hand of Tendalos. And the Hand of Tendalos, uh, the way it's set up in the scenario is, is if it kind of, if it becomes aware of you, it may start to hunt you as well. So it may have an original kind of quarry that it is going after. And in this case, it's a particular NPC in the game. But as you interact with that NPC and you have encounters with the the Hound, um, it, you, you fall into its radar. So it, it now pursues you. Uh, and so, uh, and how, I mean, there are ways potentially to kind of kill a Hound of Tend Loss, but it's really, really hard. And, and you know, when you're dealing with Call of Cthulhu characters who are just a bunch of average people in England in the 1980s, you know, with, without access to guns because it's in England and all the rest of it, it's really hard to, to kill it. So, and and as we know from the kind of fiction around Hounds of Tindalos is that they, they travel through the angles of space. 
So, um, you know, one way is to kind of solve it is to try and, you know, uh, get some plaster and, and fill in all the angles in your room so you're living in a circle. But of course, you can never leave it because once you leave, the hand will come out the angles of outside your house and get you. So that's that's that was the kind of one of the first concepts. And, and we always call that a no-win scenario because it's very... There is technically a way to solve the scenario, but you can't kill the monster. You, know, you have to deal with the monster. And in this case, I think there's an option to, if you're really lucky, maybe try and imprison it and then bury it in the ocean somewhere so hopefully it stays put. But ultimately, for the majority of games, you're just not going to kill it. And it's probably going to get you. Or you're going to end the scenario a bit like the end, uh, well, a little bit like the end of Salem's Lot, where the, the heroes are forever going to be chased by vampires because they've killed some and the other vampires don't like it and they're always going to be there, always looking over their shoulder and so the scenario can kind of end with the pieces still living but forever they're going to be looking over the shoulder and, and every angle in a room in case the hound comes out and it's quite a nice ending for a horror game that you know they are doomed but not quite yet kind of thing so that that's one way a kind of unkillable monster kind of can figure in a game i guess how are players meant to deal with monsters that are way beyond their capacity to to take on from a mechanical perspective? When it, when it's down to narrative or strategy, what's the first steps you should be taking as a player? There are a number of means to deal with an unkillable monster in terms of what, what is available in terms of the game. Um, and this does link back to why the monster is there, because obviously if you're going to put a monster in a scenario... You kind of need to at least be fair to the players and look and provide some potential ways of dealing with the monster, but uh, uh, but those kind of things can include you know often it's magic, it's a spell. It may be as simple as finding the spell to banish the creature to you know, dispel it uh, back from wherever it came from. It might be a spell that kind of traps it or um, somehow weakens it that it that it it wants to just leave and go and lick its wounds on the other side of the universe or wherever it may be so there's magic and 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 you can kind of expand that into you know magical artifacts which could do similar things to the spells um um the other the other kind of clever trick with the spell is to summon something else to deal with the monster for you so you might let's for instance you might summon a different monster um and because you've managed to successfully bind it, so it's kind of under your command for a short time, you can say, oh, you know, get rid of that thing or whatever it may be, however you want to deal with it. And so you could use monsters against monsters. I mean, obviously, that's always a risky thing, but could do. It might be that you summon something really big um, and hope that it kind of has a side effect on your monster. So let's, you know, for instance, let's summon Yogg-Sothoth to deal with the dimensional Shambler because Yogg-Sothoth is all about kind of time and space, and, and as it appears, it might you know, alter time and space around the vicinity and thereby kind of almost kind of trap the dimensional shambles in one of its bubbles, which gets sent, you know, gates away to somewhere else or another another dimension even. But it's dealt with for you. Obviously, you've now got to deal with that. You've summoned Yogg-Sothoth. That might have be created a bigger problem than you had to start with, but you have dealt with the monster you were trying to deal with. Um so there's those kind of things. And then, you know, you can expand that out into um, a lot of monsters are immune to bullets and, and physical mundane weapons, um, but they may be susceptible to magical ones. So again, you might go and find one or uh, find some spell that you can make, you know, this dagger magical. So it will pierce the, you know, the dimensional flesh of this thing or whatever it would be, which kind of gets into fighting again to some degree. But, it, you know, that's a potential it might be that it, you ward the um, the item, the weapon. It doesn't. It can't kill them, but it can kind of hurt them or make it or make their existence here uncomfortable enough that they want to leave. So you kind of like you know hitting it with a stick a bit till it goes. Oh, I'm fed up with this, and it disappears. So that's a, another potential. Um, really, there's always science. You could maybe come up work out if. The scenario allows you to determine that a monster has a particular weakness or susceptibility to something that you can actually engineer or create with science and technology, then you could do it. I mean, you know, a great example of this is a movie, the classic movie, The Blob, 
you know, uh, starring Steve McQueen. And there was a remake um, uh, some years back, but pretty good remake, um, where the blob just eats everything. And as it eats everything, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so by the end of the film, it's like the size of a city, well, side of the town. Um, and they can't, you can't, because it's a blob, it's like a big, you know, Janata thing, you know, sores just get sucked into it. However, um, one scene earlier on in the film where the heroes are hiding from it and they they hide in a uh, industrial freezer and the blob's kind of, you know, slipping under the door coming for them. And then it feels the cold and it backs away. And so through the course of the film, they work out the blob doesn't like the cold. So to deal with it, they get all the fire extinguishers from town and they're, you know, they're, they're blasting cold air and they basically momentarily freeze it enough that so the last scene of the film is this frozen blob being carried, you know, by a net, by a helicopter being dropped in the Antarctic. Unkillable, but they've trapped it and kind of dealt with it and hopefully it'll stay there till the ice caps melt, you know. So so let's jump into some specific player dynamics that you you can might find in a game of Call of Cthulhu because I think it's it's very likely that you would have a situation like you've just described where you find out the cold's effective, you go and get all the fire extinguishers. But putting that towards some more player archetypes, let's say that you are playing the researcher, the scientist, or the librarian. You get out of some kind of spooky situation and the thumper on your team turns to you and says, you got to figure out a way we can hurt this thing. Uh, what what's your first strategy if you're playing this character? What are some fun things that players can do? Okay, well, it all kind of comes under the heading of research, uh, which should not be any surprise for anyone who's played Call of Cthulhu more than a couple of times. But um, it's really research in its broadest sense. Now, the, clearly there's the let's go and find the book that tells us what to do, which is normally some sort of ancient tome like the Necronomicon or something like that, where that might tell them, yes, you need to get yieldy fire extinguishers and freeze the blob, or it might be, uh, here is a spell that will do something to deal with it, and you may or may know exactly what that will be, but you, you're you going to try it and hope for the best. Um, it might be, um, you know, the instructions on how to build this artifact or weapon that will deal with it. It might be um, if you learn this Elder Sign and you ward... The whole town, it, the creature can't now come in, so it's got to go somewhere else. Um, so there's that kind of hardcore mythos research, but you can broaden it out. Uh, you know, it, it could be that you, well, these cultists that summoned it, they clearly know more than we do. Why don't we, rather than just shoot them, or we capture one and question them, or infiltrate and learn um a bit more about it and that might tell us something about how to deal with it you know it might be that the cult leader's got a magic orb that are, that, that is that is that that has called the creature and is holding it here and if you smash the orb the creature is free to go and clearly doesn't want to hang around here so it's going to go so that might deal with it so there's many different ways you can kind of research you know but that kind of personal experience talking to people observing the creature or or looking at the aftermath of where it's been and figuring out are there any clues we can get from that the fact that you know the blob has eaten all the town but left the ice cream factory completely alone what, what can we what can we gather from that clue you know that kind of thing and it all kind of builds back into the kind of scenario design but but um coming up with you know interesting kind of um things for people to find because obviously you know while finding a tome and finding a spell to deal with it is cool. Um, if you do that in every adventure, it's going to get a little samey, just like, you know, hitting the monster with a sword in every adventure, it get a little samey. So you want to try and mix it up a bit. And and um, and also there might be barriers to it, you know, to cast a spell, there may be more things you need to do, there may be something you need to sacrifice, like your hand. And so it becomes a kind of a bit of a moral decision. Well, do we really want to do this, you know? If we do this, what's the consequence to me or us or the world? I want to talk about some of the scenario design stuff in just a second. But first of all, as somebody who tends to like to play muscle-bound tough guy characters, I want to ask about if you are playing a bruiser, you're playing somebody who can't necessarily research. In Call of Cthulhu, monsters that are, feel unkillable or that you really need to progress in the game and do a bunch of research before you're able to take on are fairly common. 
What are some tactics that you can give to players who are skill set towards being a gangster or something like that? Because I find very often there is a there is an art to trying to keep the eggheads alive long enough to be able to defeat the monster. And generally, you can run down a checklist of all kinds of stuff to do that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you want to give everyone who's playing the game something to do, and, and no one sat there bored waiting for the eggheads to, you know, engineer some machine. Um, so um, it's it's you know. Allowing the players who are playing the kind of the, the tougher kind of guys in that sense to, to to do something useful, and that might be gathering information. That might be doing the face to face stuff. That might be kidnapping the cultists or infiltrating the cult to learn more. It might be causing a distraction. So the monster's on its way to eat the people in the town. So it's up to the you know the 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 tougher ones to distract it and say no, come and eat us, and they're the they're the they're the decoy and they, you know, lead the monster on a merry chase. And hopefully, you know, it's pretty risky and dangerous and dramatic. And so that gives them plenty to do while the uh, the others are making their roles to learn spells and all the rest of it. Um, so things like that to keep people active. Um, it may be that they can kind of go hand to hand in some way with the monster, knowing they can't kill it. But they, they might be able to, you know, if you think about... Um, something like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the series, the vampire's in there. Buffy doesn't kind of just walk up to a vampire and stake it. She has to she has to kind of wear it down. And that's what, you know, the fighting is all about, is wearing the vampire down so its energy levels are down. And then when she stakes it, poof, you know, it turns to dust. It could be similar, you know, with this. While they can't kill it, they can weaken it or they can hurt it enough that it, 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 it withdraws for a while. So that buys more time for the whole group to kind of work out a solution. So things, you know, give active characters something active to do in that sense. Let's finish things off then on a note for keepers who might be running a game. I've had some mixed experiences putting really tough monsters into games that aren't Call of Cthulhu because it's a little difficult to judge how powerful something is. When people play a lot of strategic combat games, there can be an expectation that if something appears, you can kill it. And even if you can't right away, there's usually a, a MacGuffin, a potion, a something that means that you're able to do the fight in a different uh, kind of situation. How are you able to put these cosmic sometimes beings into a game uh, with the uh, with the like player knowledge intact that they should deal with this in an intelligent way rather than just running at it and hitting it okay there's a number of things you've asked me there i'll try and unpack that a little bit okay number one as a shorthand in determining is your monster more powerful than you thought it was is when you're looking at it in the book in terms of its stats and things look at how many attacks it's got and look at what you know what those attacks do. If it's only got one attack, I mean, it tends to be a shorthand. Is monsters with one attack, if they're bigger than humanoid size, um, tend to be a pretty powerful one-hit wonder. So it might do eight or ten plus damage with one hit, which you know just equate that to one PC a turn is dead. Yeah. Um, whereas uh, it might have four to eight attacks. And they're all in the region of, you know, 1d4 to 1d6, something like that. So no one hit is going to necessarily kill a PC outright, but it will do a serious hit. And it will, you know, let's just assume it always hits and it always does worse damage. It, it's going to take it, it's going to take at least two to three rounds per character for them to die when they meet the monster. So that's just kind of cold, hard facts to give you as a kind of a, a working point to think, OK, my group is... I've got four characters. This monster deals one attack a turn and it does 1d10 or 1d20 of damage, yeah? They're going to survive at most four turns and then they're all dead, yeah? Is that what I want in the game? Will the players be happy with that? So you need to think about whether you're going to use that monster. And if you do, what am I going to help the players to have to overcome this? You know, are they going to get access to a some sort of armory spell or, you know, whatever it may be? that mitigates, that gives them a bit more of a chance. Now, the other thing is, obviously, Call of Cthulhu, unlike a lot of games, is unbalanced by design. It is a mirror, in a sense, of the real world, and bad things happen even, you know, even unexpectedly. You know, and that's related into the fragility of the characters and their, their low hit points and, 
being able to, you know, on your day, first out as an investigator, you could meet a deep one and kind of an average size opponent. You could run into a shogger, yeah? That will probably eat you straight away. But that's life and that's a Cthulhu mythos. And that's why the game is a horror game because it's the threat is real in the sense of the characters. However, um, so I'm trying to understand the kind of where the where the monster fits on the scale, but um, understand where the monster is in your story. You know, what is its purpose? Monsters are more than just eating, killing machines, unless they're jaws, which then they would be eating and killing machines. <laughs> but um, uh, it, they, they are more, they often have got an intelligence equal, if not above your kind of human character intelligence in the game. So they're not, you know, brainless eating zombies in that sense. They have a they have their own mysterious agendas, which we don't need to know what they are. They're just mysterious. So they don't necessarily need to, they won't necessarily attack PCs on site. You know, they may be curious about, these may be the first humans, the color out of space has ever experienced because it's just landed and so it kind of observes and it kind of tests and see what happens and then then learns oh i can feed off these people you know maybe you know, just think about it kind of being a, a new to the environment situation or it's got another agenda it's not interesting the pcs because it's going after the 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 gem of arg which is sat in the museum because really that's secretly something else to do with the mythos and it wants to eat it and get its power and that's really why it's there so think think about where how your monster fits into the story what is what is its component in your larger story you know where does it fit it might be that it is the story that it is it's landed here it's arrived here and the whole point of the story is to deal with the monster in some way you know that kind of goes back to that you in your small corner scenario I described with the hand of tindlas you know the scenario is dealing with the hand of tindlas as Nothing else you can really do once that starts. So working out how, what are the options the players could come up with, you know, pre-think some through to, you know, help the players out a little bit if they need a clue or a bit of a tip. Um, but allow some latitude, allow the players to have, you know, their own ideas. And and, and if they sound really cool and dramatic and would make really help the story, then, then why not? Yeah, but well, that sounds like it's going to work. Let's give it a go, you know, and see what happens. Um so, you know, being being a little flexible. Um, and then there's one other option that you are playing an unwinnable scenario because you want to do an unwinnable scenario and your players are kind of up for it. I mean, I, I, you know, it's always a catch-22. Do you let your players know this is an unwinnable scenario and thereby kind of take a bit of its bite away because the players know that up front? Or do you want them to get the full impact of like, oh, we, we could never win. How terrible, you know, and the horror comes on them. And that really comes down to knowing your players well. So an unwinnable scenario is not really ideal for a convention um, where you don't really know the players and you don't really know how they're going to take it. Uh, and that might be one where you would advertise that this is a really hard scenario, almost impossible. Very likely your PCs will die if you play this. So you're kind of giving some headlines up front. So people are kind of set up for it. It might be your home group where you know the players really well and you can spring that kind of surprise on them and they can have a moan at you and throw, you know, popcorn at you at the end because you've been a terrible, terrible keeper but we really enjoyed the game and next week we'll get back onto our normal campaign where our characters might live more than one session, you know, kind of thing. But it just comes down to, you know, what are you going for? What do your players want? You might have group players that just are never going to like that kind of scenario, so don't run it for them. You know, change it up, change it that the monster can be dealt with in some way. You know, they can banish it off with a spell or trap it down the mine or it's, you know, it doesn't like heat, so they instead of the Antarctica, they drop it in the desert or something like that, you know, that, that allows them to deal with it and have a sense of victory. And of course, a lot of these ways of dealing with it is just to put it off for another day. You know, even if they've trapped it in the desert, what happens on the, that freak weather incident where the desert suddenly cools down because of this terrible storm that comes in and it reawakens and, and leaves and then comes looking for them again. You know, and they've gone, now got to deal with it, but just later on. You know, and it's a new challenge again, kind of thing. So there's lots of ways you can make it happen. And it's great sometimes building into the character's arc, that kind of sense of like we we've kind of dealt with it, but not really. 
So we're always going to be looking over our shoulder for it, which plays into the drama later on in other scenarios that may be unconnected to that, but you can draw upon their their growing fear that they know that there's always that the back of their head that they never really dealt with it that can kind of reappear in their heads in as a delusion or some sort of effect on them in in in, in the future that kind of you know makes it more scary. 